There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All to Innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, and this recording is coming to you from April 10th, 2020, the only time in any of our lives where we get an entire month of 420. So it's a pretty special moment if you like that sort of thing. And as we seem to be descending deeper into dystopia every day, it appears to me that any little silver linings we can see around the storm clouds of societal sickness should be enjoyed to the fullest and shared all around. Hopefully this episode can help you turn the constriction of corona quarantine into a creative alchemical quickening and get you questioning the symbolic significance of our state-mandated solitary confinement sentences. Because this time around we've got the literal best guest available for such literary labors, with the return of the incredible communicator of potently noetic poetics, the metaphysical matron of whimsical verbal mysticism, and passionate advocate of upgrading the English language, Laurel Erica. As a lifetime lover of linguistics and professional word player, Laurel teaches what she calls foreign English for native speakers. By reveling in revealing languages' hidden meanings, exposing arcane or unknown words to modern ears, and demonstrating the undeniable magic that's woven into our lives through the Logos. A human thesaurus and living dictionary like Laurel is one of the most entertaining speakers you'll ever hear, and her energetic utterances might just crack the calcification of your third ear. Last time she was with us back in October of 2018, we talked about the secret spells of the English language, the joy in playing with words instead of being played by them, deceptively negative words to watch out for, and we learned a lot of new words in the process. In the time since that first interview, Laurel and I have become good friends, and having her back on the show is long overdue, but surely in perfect synchronistic timing because in a state of global lockdown, her inspirational insights and elegant elocutionary expertise ought to be just what the consciousness doctor ordered. You can find Laurel's work at wordmagicglobal.com and laurelerica.com, where you can pick up her Word Magic book in text or audio forms, or get in touch with her for a variety of language-related consultations, including editing services for any of our budding authors out there in the audience. Check the show notes for links to all of Laurel's online homes, and also for the link to Interverse Plus on Patreon, where you can subscribe to this show via patreon.com forward slash interverse and get the extended version of this and all other episodes for a meager $5 a month, simultaneously supporting a podcast you love and getting twice as much of it. And I'm excited to be giving heartfelt thanks for the very nice surge of new members that we've got so far in April. In these uncertain times, you can be sure of one thing. Interverse isn't subject to social distancing, and we're just getting started with this podcasting journey. And if you're prone to providing patronage to powerfully positive people, don't forget that Laurel has a Patreon page as well, where you can show your support to our friendly neighborhood bard and unlock her offerings of excellent and patron-exclusive prose and verse. And now it's time to take some deep and grounding breaths, smoke them if you've got them, and get ready to start making sense of the mystery of our mouth sounds, reveal the deeper repercussions of our discussions, and prove to ourselves the power that we have to speak reality into being. With the unraveler of mass hypnosis and frequency-elevating emissary of the fairies, the admirably laudable Laurel Erica. Thanks so much for joining us once again, and welcome to Interverse. Well, that, that was fabulous. It was flabbergastingly fabulous. You were so careful in that introduction that you put together. I would love a copy. It's just brilliant, and, and it's incredible, and I am so deeply honored, and I thank you so much. Why don't you uh, let people know what you've been up to since 2018? What are you finding interesting these days in our inner world of linguistic neural programming that we all experience every day? I just wrote a piece, which you, I think, read called De Grand Galad, a word that defines the times. And I'm going to be posting that on my Patreon site. It essentially means a sudden deterioration of circumstances and events. And I also, in that piece, share the word cacistocracy, which is the kind of government that is worldwide and it's ruled by the worst person. Uh, ruled by the worst persons in society. And so 
I put together an expression of foreign English for native speakers that when you read the article, you will understand. And it, it is that the global cacistocracy is responsible for the juggernaut that has brought us this insuperable degringolade. So what that means is this worldwide insanity brought to us by people with very low levels of consciousness who have brought about this total deterioration of the quality of the air, the earth, the economy, education, religion, and life itself has brought us to a point where we are facing mass extinction. And there are a lot of fearful thoughts about what is going to happen, a sense of powerlessness. And yet, as I point out in this article, our whole culture, Western culture and also Eastern cultures, believe that the catalyst of creation is the word itself. And we all have the word on the tips of our tongue and fingers. And so what could we possibly do with the power of the word to start, as I like to put it, turning the tide on the global C, S-E-E, of consciousness? Because we are creating the world right now in the image and likeness of the least aspects of ourself, our, our, our least enlightened selves. The culture encourages the beast instead of the best in us all. And I just listened to a YouTube on word magic was the title of it. And it was about the use of language by the dark magicians to hypnotize us, to cast its spells, and to keep us locked in this matrix made out of words. And what I offer that is a slightly different from that perspective is a recognition of two things. One is that some of this, some of these spells are not intentionally peppered in the language. I think it's a naturally occurring phenomena. We have the phrase, the metal of mind, which is a, the, the character and quality of mind. And it's also the pun metal. It's spelled M-E-T-T-L-E but it's also M-E-T-A-L, M-E-D-D-L-E, and M-E-D-A-L. So minds are magnetic, like metal can be magnetic. And when we have enough minds focused on anything, we can manifest that anything, which is why it's so important that we not only watch what we say, but listen as well for all the multiple meanings in it and how they can direct consciousness in so many different areas that are subverting our intentions. I was just sitting back and enjoying the ride. I was like, this is what I paid for. This is the <laughs> this is the ticket I bought to hear you drop so many awesome little nuggets of wisdom throughout that entire poetic monologue, you'd call it. And what I really, really liked, the thing that I might want to grasp onto a little more, other than to say that that article that you started off discussing, I had that pegged as the first thing I was probably going to bring up. <laughs> I love that specific quote about the cacistocracy. But I wanted to go more into how language is shaped by our unconscious, because this is an idea that I want to explore throughout multiple future episodes from several angles. Basically, that what we experience as the <laughs> the world outside of us is shaped by etheric pathways, you could call them, that the Patterns in our minds, our brains that create neural pathways that make it sort of difficult for us to get out of certain kind of behavioral ruts or th those mental patterns, basically, they exist on an as above, so below level in the greater universe outside of us as well. And these are sort of like the ways that the mass mind is shaping society, if that makes sense. And the language is definitely the matrix in which it's used. And there's... <laughs> There's other ways to think about language being sort of a illusory matrix as well that we'll probably need to get into. But yeah, bam, coming out the gate strong. <laughs> I love this. 
Let me get you a, a more specific question in there. What ways can we look at language as being shaped by our unconscious, our collective unconscious, you know, words that mean more than what people actually think that they mean. They're deeper. I want to use the example government because just the roots of that word are govern, which is control and mint, which is, you know, mental mentality, mind. So there's a word where most people look at it and maybe think of it as a protector or a group, but the actual unconscious meaning of that word that we're using all the time is actually a more akin to mind control, stuff like that. Okay. And that's not a word that I have explored. And let me see if I can catch a thread that will weave into what you're interested in. So let me try this poem as an introduction and see if it works. My name is Laurel Erica, and I'm an alphabet alchemist, oracle of the metaphorical and cultural commentator to the highest denominator, sorceress of the the thoris. My words are coined of heavy metal, so need no ironies for weight, for truth is gold, and I won't settle for less when I communicate. My purpose is to comment with light humor and with eloquence on the state of earth, air, fire, water, and assorted other human elements, most especially on the language, for I've every reason to suspect it sounds our depths and thus reflects its impact on our intellects. Now, my poet's license specifies I'm not to judge or criticize, yet who, I ask, has better right than does the poet to indict, which means to blame and arraign when spelled I-N-D-I-C-T, but which also means to compose or write when spelled I-N-D-I-T-E. Since poetry potentially can be a form of alchemy whose potency, once it is stirred, invokes a world with just a word, my voice is quite intentional. It's metaphor dimensional, yet full of fun, for I am proud to speak in metaphor and pun, no close facsimiles allowed. It's for this reason I was born, to fill the land with jubilation, for to my maker I have sworn to use the word for recreation. So this shall be my resurrection to share with you my deep reflections upon the layers of implications inferred by word reverberations. As I've been blessed with the ability and a certain universality to demonstrate the hidden freight on the trains of thought most people take. The purpose for these explorations is to write them to new destinations. Now, from these words, you may deduce I'm the metaphysical mother goose, and my poetry is a celebration of the English language in translation. For I know the wavelength on the English channel, so I'm here to mother goose our usage to help turn the tide since our current annals reveal what a twisted tongue produces. Now, I know that you won't be surprised to hear that we've been hypnotized. So the special thing I'm here to tell is that our words create the spell and that our problems are compounded because English is confounded for the echoes of our history and our psyche are resounded through the symbols of the alphabet as well as through our puns. And yet, few recognize what thoughts are stirred by the secret spells 
of the unheard word. So a lot of people are becoming more aware that there are a lot of secret spells in the English language. And I, my most popular video is called The Secret Spells of the English Language, and it's only a tip of the tip of the iceberg. There are spells, I, I call it our premier life sentence, and it's about how we live our everyday life, how we speak of the days of the week, which is like what a somnambulist is doing, walk, sleepwalking through life. And in nursery school, we hear life is but a dream. The truth is out there. It's just sometimes difficult to distinguish. So if you look at the word life's dream and life stream, you'll hear that they really are synonymous. We are creating the life stream, the dream of our collective reality. And English, one of the points I make in my recent essay on the word de Grandelade is that the British empire has receded from its control of a large portion of the world the world, but it left the English language, which colonizes consciousness everywhere. And the English language is filled with a lot of duplicitous words. And I believe that is so not only because some of these words were actually uh, intentionally created, but I also think it's like a footprint and its echo that Words are constantly echoing and reflecting human consciousness. And so we can hear these echoes all the time, and they're really everywhere throughout the language. So one of the points, or really the initial point that I make in my word magic vision statement is that in all our efforts to heal our psyches and raise consciousness on this planet, we have all but overlooked the very instrument of conscious thought and creation. Yet our forked tongue English language, which is the leading software of the Western mind, is itself in great need of retuning and upgrading. Over the course of my life, I have cultivated a heightened sensitivity to how the total normality of insanity in society is echoed, reflected, and reinforced by the English language, which inadvertently propagates an antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control at a time when people had to surrender their minds if they wanted to keep their heads about them, quite literally. So as you and I were speaking earlier in this day, Chance, I believe that the reason people were so were tortured and destroyed for holding a different opinion is because when you can take the metal of the mass mind and form that energy as one consensual glob, it is a powerful electromagnetic force to propagate and permeate the life stream with a particular perspective that keeps us enslaved. And so holding a thought outside of the matrix of beliefs of, of I mean, the whole world is make believe, isn't it? That when we step outside of that matrix, force and false belief, then we start creating our own reality. And now more and more of us are, are stepping outside the concentration camp that is Western consciousness concentrated on the English language, which is so duplicitous. So here's my vision, because I, I just want to point out that not only are there secret spells in the language, and I was, I'll share some of the others that aren't in that original video, but there are also what I call sacred path words. And these are words in which our innate human wisdom comes up and bubbles up to the surface. And one of the points I made is that language is not only grammatical, it's hologrammatical. 
as well. So it's constantly echoing and reflecting human consciousness. So one of the obvious sacred path words is the fact that the word earth is the same as the word heart. It's just where you put the letter H. And I asked some children what that may mean. What's the significance? And one little boy of seven said, well, maybe the earth is the heart of our solar system. And uh, another child said, well, the earth is the heart of our lives. And so one of my taglines for word magic is that it turns youngsters into punsters and punsters into pundits. And a pundit is a pandit in Sanskrit. It's um, a wise being. It's not just a talking head on a television show. So playing with words in this way can make a person more aware, more literate, more wise and compassionate. So the, the vision is not simply to become aware of these secret spells or to speak more lightly when we use them, but is to reinvent language. If it's software, then it has cultural biases akin to computer viruses that infect our thinking with this antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church. So if we elect collectively to upgrade the English language to a higher frequency, through our linguistic creativity and naturally occurring verbal eccentricities, then ultimately, even clatter from our idle chatter, prattle patter, blabber blather and palaver as we jabber gab and babble on, will turn our glowing terms from verbal vapor, either hanging in the air or trapped on paper, into tiny bits of shiny matter as we gather, chat, and natter on, and with new skillet, thrilling, thrilling statements that instill fulfilling imagery of higher possibility, will finally still the quiet riot of the wild child's manic panic through the mind, so we can flip the switch, enlightening every circuit of our consciousness through the electric surge of verbiage that encourages superb and selfless services to spread from soul to soul around the globe by what is said in all the light years up ahead. And then from the islands of silence between all that's spoken, we will listen as doors to the heartland spring open. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love how you flow in and out of your verses. And you really blew my mind with the way that the we talk when we're talking about this idea of the language actually being the program our reality runs on. And I love the idea of sort of creating space outside of that matrix, if you will, and using words to make something different and turn the tide, so to speak. <laughs> I like to think that this shows my particular effort at doing that. But what I think is useful about this idea or what's coming to me is how if you do want to like the world that you're going to change is going to be your world. And that's the whole universe as far as you're concerned. <laughs> that is your universe. So what I think is best to do to get out of that sort of stuck in the matrix language slave system is to build a different type of container that you can start putting your energy into, putting your language into, putting your art into. It doesn't necessarily have to be even English language at that point. The container could be that now you're a painter and you're putting energy into that form of communication. It's really just about upgrading our communication, even if it's in a different part of our infinite spectrum than just this sort of mostly used by the left brain type of language that <laughs> is a very divisive and compartmentalizing. And when we start looking at the multiple meanings of words, that's us connecting into the right brain, the the uh, deep unconscious, letting us see the left brain is sort of the scientific, the measurement, the observer, and it's trying to put things into categories. And so it's like, this is what that word means to me. And that's the way I use it. Or that's the way I'm using it right then. And it only means that. And the right brain's like, no, every time you say the word metal, it's also all those other forms of 
the sound metal. <laughs> it hears it hears and processes all of that at once. So what I think I think that making our own container to put our our communication into our expression into that'll actually kind of hold it. Whether you know that could be making a website, could be starting, I guess right right about now an online store is your best bet, but it doesn't necessarily even have to be tied to vocation or your your way of making money for yourself. <laughs> well, we, we need to transcend that whole idea, of course, but like ba- baby steps here, baby steps here. There's a wonderful statement by an author for whom I did promotional work. I wrote a media kit for him years ago. His name is Simon Peter Fuller. And the book I worked on is called Rising Out of Chaos, the New Heaven and the New Earth. And what he said is that we all have come with unique talents and energies, which are part of the great jigsaw of life. And for the plan of evolution to function, each piece is as important as any other. So I completely agree with you. Find your niche, (laughs) find what you most love to do, how you can be your most creative self, which way the the divine music flows through you or which ways and out into the world. When I know for myself, when I'm playing with words, I get into that, the vortex. And the other day I was, I, I was hearing in my head that when you are God's own, you are in the God zone. You are, you enter the God zone and or the vortex. So I believe that just as there is a darkening of the dark, there is also a lightening of the light and a greater infusion of divine energy that can grant our spiritual gifts for us very quickly. We've all been laboring to reach this moment for a very long time when we can make that jump into hyperspace and become supernatural, as Joe Dispenza says. A gentleman named Chris Story in England, last name is spelled S-T-O-R-E-Y, has put together this whole map of ascension. If you go to, I think his site is Primal Alchemy. And marvelous offerings that he has. So I am in total agreement with you in terms of finding what you love to do. And I really feel like this period of time, which is in one way an extended vacation and in other ways uh, can be uh, an opportunity for a lot of fear, anxiety, and especially if you or a loved one is ill at this time. If you are blessed to be in good health, then we're out of the pressure of the days of the week and earning our living, earns being ashes for the dead. And this really can be used as a time of incubation for ascension. And that is by cultivating what we most love to do that puts us into the God zone. I also believe, however, that this is time for us to create a global experiment where we find out just how powerful the word is. We grew up hearing that it is synonymous with God, that it is the catalyst for all that exists. So if that is true, and if it is true that our minds unified together for an intention can manifest that intention very quickly, then what is the possibility that if we were all to look at language as software and the hidden biases as uh, viruses that reflect this ancient misguided perception of reality that the, the vision of a universe that's divided irreconcilably by warring male superpowers, the fallen state of humanity, the misery of life, and the inferiority of of women is all over the language and on the level of uh, homonyms. And so that's present along with the the sacred path words. So 
I recently heard Lynn McTaggart saying that we need a new perceptual framework for people to see their lives in this reality. And Greg Braden said what we need is a new neutral language that we can communicate with each other person to person. Besides emojis, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Besides emojis. And that this will give us an evolutionary edge. And that has been what I have contended. I have a whole vision for how we can do it. And it is through a literary lotto. I also have quite a few uh, beautiful statements about what will happen when we do. I discovered after realizing that language is software and we can upgrade it, I came across a statement by Confucius that said that the first thing he would do if given charge of the governance of a country would be to correct the language. And Socrates said, incorrect language is not only a mistake, it implants evil in men's souls. And I I give some others, uh, I have quite a few and I've, I've cited some others. Orwell, would you share the Orwell one? Because that one was really relevant for right now. Oh, isn't that a good one? Yes. Okay. Let me find that. Um, That is in the De Grand Galad article. So if people will go to my Patreon website, I will, I will upload De Grand Galad right away and you'll see some of them. So let me find Orwell. He said one ought to recognize that the present political chaos is connected with the decay of language and that one can probably bring about some improvement by starting at the verbal end. And Dennis Weaver, the actor, said changing mass consciousness is an individual responsibility. And the Nobel Prize winning poet Octavio Paz said, when a society becomes corrupt, what first grows gangrenous is language. Social criticism, therefore, begins with grammar and the reestablishment of meaning. So there, are, if you go to my website, I have wordmagicglobal.com. I have a whole series of quotations about words and about the infection of the mind that happens when the language deteriorates and how it causes a deterioration of the whole culture. So we collectively can upgrade the English language to a higher frequency through our linguistic creativity and naturally occurring verbal eccentricity, as I said just a little bit ago. And I'll, I'll share more about that as we go. It seems to me that it's a, almost a natural thing that when somebody gets more aligned, so to speak, I mean, I've experienced this myself. Uh, the first thing that happens is language begins to flow, not just effortlessly, but effervescently. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's filled, it becomes filled with light. and. I've seen lots of people that get <laughs> for their shockers activated <laughs> by some some means or another. And then all of a sudden they're uh, on the spot barred. They just become able to freestyle rhyme crazily. Uh, you know, like I've seen this happen to people a few times. They just get activated and then all of a sudden language becomes a right and left brain dance instead of just this. Uh, st- staggering, struggling to get out what we mean and all all the uh, crutch words that we use constantly <laughs> because not realizing is whenever we're having trouble even expressing and communicating, it's something out of alignment in ourselves <laughs> and, and it can actually be addressed or it can be seen as a symptom to be addressed by healing the body and getting the b- mind-body relationship into a better balance because that's another version of the left brain, right brain relationship. So what I also thought was really interesting is how you were talking about the opportunity of this time, how we're no longer in the days of the week. Well, I am actually, I still, my day job is essential apparently. So I'm still in the days, but not everybody is. And in general, we have this opportunity in right now to use knowledge and to reinvent ourselves in any way almost that we could ever imagine. And past life karma has never been easier to deal with and address. Like there's really just opportunities for every type of 
angle that you want to look at your energetic expansion in this lifetime. Whereas in almost any point in the history of our ancestors, it's like you're okay. You're born in this village. You can farm or you can maybe be like a blacksmith if you're lucky and you can get someone to teach you that there was not a lot of opportunity for us to actually be who we are in our deepest, unique sense. And now is the time where that's all actually possible. It's like you said, a culmination point of so many things. But at the same time, as the light gets lighter, the dark gets darker. I wanted to point out that the kind of total surveillance state, dystopia, uh, computer controlled, everything, AI future that seems to be coming thanks to companies like Google and Facebook and <laughs> intelligence agencies. That is all like if there is an artificial intelligence that's working right now, if someone has created that and is using it in some way to manipulate humanity then that's actually a language thing as well. You know, everything in computers is like a code, a type of language code. And you could even say that the way that uh, English colonized the world at a certain point when the English, the British Empire was spreading was also the way that uh, the, the computer code is now colonized the world. And we see computers and smartphones and things like that, basically totally ubiquitous. And it's, it's really changed our relationship to each other and to uh, like authority and the idea of experts. Like you, we think we know everything because we can look something up on our phone and Google it really quick. But we just pick that first top result answer and say, that's the answer. Now I know when we probably don't even take the time to go look at an alternative view of and everything's got two sides. So uh, anyway, that was a long ramble, but you really got me thinking about all kinds of stuff, especially this idea that. English was a colonization in our consciousness or in our imagination and uh, the computer code language, how that's operating on us now in a, from the external level more than the internal and how symbolic that seems to be that now the control is more coming from an external code that we can't even, most of us can't even translate ourselves. <laughs> the computer code, the new colonization. I, I so appreciate everything that you just shared. Your awareness is so brilliant about what happens when mind and body and the hemispheres of the brain and the heart are all aligned. And it is just pure flow. And the innate genius of human intelligence flows through us. And it's just such an exquisite experience. And the word you used about you become a bard, and, and because I have double hearing, I heard B-A-R-R-E-D, barring the bards, so that truth cannot be spoken. And there is such a jumble of truth and falsity, so that it's so difficult to make a distinction. And the blessing in that, since everything has both the dark and the light, is self-reliance becomes essential in, in cultivating that internal awareness of what is truth for us, what inspires us, what promotes positive feelings in us, and go with that. And that can be very challenging. I mean, I, I, I felt for years that this was we enter this dimension and it's like pin the tail on the donkey. You're, you're blindfolded, spun around and given a sharp object and then <laughs> to try and put it in the right place and penalized if you miss. And so that is the world and, and the, the spelling W-H-I-R-L-E-D is really this motion of the world. And that's not the etymology. It's not related I look at linguistic synchronicities. So when you were speaking of the alphabet as code and the code that runs the computers that run our lives to an ever increasing degree and, and how we don't know what that code is. But similarly, we don't really know the alphabet code to any great degree. And I have a poem on the letter S called Esoterica by Laurel Erica. 
the definitive exegesis on the letter S in verse. And I, I'm not going to share it at this moment. It really needs visuals to be fully enjoyed. So if among the listeners there are animators who would like to play with me and take that on, I, I would welcome that. So one letter that I can also share, another letter is the letter I. And just as we have two I's, there are two I's in the alphabet. There's the lowercase i, where the, the little dot above the line and a separation between them is like the mind separated from the body. It's the small egoic self, where we feel very diminished, ineffectual, and can get very um, outraged and loud, like the word irate anger, but it's also like irate, irate, greater respect. And the word berate, which is to speak with a lot of anger towards someone. And it's, it's denigrating them. It's saying that they are, they are not, they don't rate being treated with respect. And just as there is, as we understand it, an alliance working on our behalf at this time to help defeat the cabal, and a greater infusion of light uh, coming onto the planet. And we know from our own personal experience that this light, this source field is love intelligence. And science is recognizing the field. I was listening to a clip of the matrix and it was saying the matrix is all around you. You see it, you feel it everywhere we go. But more powerful than that is the source field, which is within us all and all around us. And so being so bombarded by conflicting stories and lies disguised as truth and needing to become much more self-referential to be able to guide our way through this, that in this same way, this connection with our own higher self, our own inner compass, and you mentioned the you know, the deafness are are becoming more attentive through the third ear. And if you look at the word heart, it's ear. And that is our third ear is in our heart. And when we listen to our heart, we put our ear to the earth and we listen to our heart, then we can become an oracle. That wisdom that comes through us when we're in alignment comes through everybody. And there's, where's that wonderful Arthur Miller quote? So he was uh, an American playwright in the 20th century, I think a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he said, everyone, when they get quiet, when they become desperately honest with themselves, everyone is capable of uttering profound truths. We all derive from the same source. There is no mystery about the origin of things. We are all part of creation all kings, all poets, all musicians. We have only to open up, only to discover what is already there. So when we do that and we hold the intention to download new symbols, sounds, words, metaphors, and phrases that can inspire higher consciousness and write down what comes to you. Maybe it comes in a dream. Maybe it comes through some synchronicity in the outer world. Write it down and share it. Share it with your friends. And I'm going to be collecting them and with a group of people who want to join me, we can we can evaluate those that we feel have the most potential for positive reverberations in the world, and we can use them to put on T-shirts, to put on mugs. We will profit the profit who sends it in. So, if you want to, we'll start with the literary lotto. On my Patreon site, if you would like to email me a word or a phrase or a letter that you feel can help lift consciousness, put us more into that heart-centered alignment, then I will start collecting them and sharing them with others, and we will start creating this literary lotto. 
in which we celebrate the prophet who brings through the wisdom and also profits the prophet when we sell the product of their wisdom. So that's part of my vision. Listening to that really got me resonating on several topics and I maybe I'll just go through them in order. Please do. <laughs> Talking about the connection between bard and bard. I never thought about that before, but another meaning of bard is like you're barred as a lawyer. You are able to uphold the legal system or the justice system or a judge is barred, possibly. The bar is where the, what they sit at. Yes, but when they're barred from it, they are, well, they call it, isn't it uh, disbarred or something? Or di Yeah, disbarred, that might be correct. Yeah. And the actual, the planetary archetypal symbol or God for that concept is actually Saturn. And Saturn was referred to in some ancient cultures as Bar. That was one of the mm. names for Saturn or for that God or energy. And so that's where they wear like black robes, the judges do and went, and all that. But I just think that's very interesting that the, the judge is the one who's asking the questions. And when you're asking, it's as king. Mm. And the Bard is the one that's like telling the story to the judge. And the the lawyer is the one that's telling the story to the judge and the lawyer has to be barred. I don't know. <laughs> that's, maybe that's too far out, but I feel like there's definitely some connections there. Well, and it all interweaves, echoes and reflects constantly. And you can really go endlessly in this. So, yes, and please keep going. And then the other one that really got me thinking was rate. Because especially in context to this whole like digital surveillance technocracy dystopia thing that we're seeing slide into place more and more all the time. Uh, one thing that many restaurants are now terrified about is to get a bad rating. Someone's going to rate you really badly. And that just sounds like the word rape. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it I never made the connection between I rate and B rate with just the regular word rate. But now I see, and I've seen it all the time. There's even people you know, I got to love them. There's still there's people out there that like they are Yelp reviewers and that's their thing. And they get a lot of satisfaction out of like nitpicking all kinds of crazy details about a restaurant experience they had. And they put as much effort into writing that thing, that rate as uh, you would put into one of your poems. And they're like, yeah, I, got, I, I showed them or whatever. I don't really know what about that feels good. Unless you're the type that is giving good ratings just to try to like make things you like get more popular. It can go both ways. But just that word rate is weird because it's like back to the judging thing. It's a judgment thing. And uh, judgment is pretty divisive. And I don't know. <laughs> really got me going, though. Well, it brought me back uh, that rating people and, and ratings that are actually B ratings. <laughs> And <laughs> that, that are, another word is excoriations. They are scouring and scoring in a very demeaning way. And that comes from the little eye, where there is the head detached from the body. That little eye can get very, well, let me, let me do a few lines of a piece called The Eye That Is We. And that I spell that A Y E, uh, A Y E. That is O U I. I'm gonna be honest. I was hoping that this one would get busted out today. I like this one a lot. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Did I send you my book? Is that how you know it? Yeah, and I've definitely listened to the audio version on Spotify as well. Oh, good. Thank you so much. So here we are. This this little piece explains about the two different kinds of I in the alphabet. So you'll have to picture this for yourself since we don't have the animation for it. And just make note, it is in my book on CD of poetry called Word Magic, Wordplay That Puts a New Spin on the World. Sometimes I feel a little like a little I. Insignificant, alone, fragmented and shy. 
Mind detached from body, diminished in size, the epitome, oh, pity me, of self-compromise. Other times I tower with the courage, strength, and power of the capital I that touches the sky and connects it to earth. Then my sense of self-worth is completely removed from the impulse to prove who I am by what I have, think, say, feel, know, or do. When I'm there, I'm aware that the I that I am is the all-seeing I, and I identify with the source and the force and the course of creation without hesitation, for I know there's no distance between me and my deity. But when the resistance renews its insistence, my peace falls to pieces, all certainty ceases, as ego increases its volume by 10, and I suddenly feel awfully little again. When I'm in my small eye, everything that I try seems no more than a trifle. Yet I know that I stifle a much larger expression through my own retrogression. So, since the size of my eyes clearly shifts with my vision, my identity must surely be a matter of decision. But though I pray for fulfillment, I'm still programmed to oppose. For though there's yes in my eyes, there's still no in my nose. And it's not an easy victory when one's made self-contradictory and has lived for such a while in almost total self-denial. But since the feeling of my being all depends on how I'm seeing, it's perception, not perfection, that is ultimately freeing. So by letting the eyes have it, I am sure that I will see that the rewards in life I'm seeking are already here in me. So that's the eye that is we. I, I love how every time I hear that, different things jump out at me. And on this one, this time around, perception over perfection. It's actually that perception... <laughs> Trying to attain perfection is impossible, but expanding your perception actually shows you the perfection that's already there. You can't make something <laughs> perfect. You just have to see how it actually fits into the big picture to see that it already was like that's it says so much in so few words on uh, just in that line alone. And I really love that. And also, I had one more thing pop into my head after we were talking about this <laughs> to go back to the rate thing. The one last thing that I thought was really interesting is we're actually seeing this social crediting thing happen, which is another way that words are imprisoning people. Have you heard of this phenomenon in in a communist? The Communist Party in China has rolled out. Well, why don't you share more about it? Yes. Yeah. So social crediting is actually keeping people from being able to do stuff in uh, like travel or leave the country based on whether or not they've like said the wrong thing online or made the wrong people annoyed with them. And the way that people now rate and review restaurants online, that's the way that the government is going to have a page of ratings on you if you're in China. And, you know, some people definitely would want to make that type of system here. And the, that uh, point system or whatever you want to call it, that rating system, social crediting system will actually dictate what you can and can't do in society. So it's like the ultimate language prison in a sense, because even though you're not physically being restrained, just through this web of words that's been spun around your name, now you have lack of access to all kinds of different things. And uh, that's maybe a little off topic from the poem you just read, although that poem, I think, <laughs> explains how... The situation can go that far. The the little eye run amok. Lots of little eyes run amok. <laughs> yes, right. Like chickens with their heads cut off. That's how we've been. We, we've used the phrase insane as being out of your mind, but it's actually being out of your body and into your mind. You can't 
you can't fool the body between pleasure and pain, but you can trick the mind. And so I have felt that there is this impulse toward union. And I have wonderful quotes by Teilhard de Chardin, who was a paleontologist and Jesuit priest. Um, anyway, he talks about if there wasn't the impulse toward union between cells, that love couldn't appear between human beings. So that which connects is the whole universe together is this love intelligence. So we are at this extraordinary crisis point where uh, it's either, in, in a poem I wrote years ago, the choices left are exaltation or global excommunication. And it's so interesting that whatever is behind this lockdown that has everybody um, atomized separate from each other. And now Zoom is such a popular medium. And now there's Zoom bombing to try and keep people from connecting. But the impulse in our species evolution is this interconnection to come together like, there's a wonderful word, murmuration, uh, which is it means, of course, the act of murmuring, but it's also when starlings come together and thousands of birds and they fly as one mass. It's an aerial ballet and they never collide. And we are coming at a time at, to a time when there is this impulse for us all to come together in a, a human murmuration in which we are working at recognizing, I mean, the, the starling murmuration is for the protection of everybody and, and the finding of food and shelter. That's the speculation of scientists. So if humans working in that conscious alignment are magnetically attracting the the connection with others, we can come together as the super organism. And the fact that this is such a profound impulse awakening in everybody's hearts who are in the process of awakening and evolving, and it's matched on the dark side by this this desire to bring all humans under the control, like ants under the control of a queen. And operating mindlessly as, quote, civil servants, doing the bidding, sacrificing themselves, having no life of our own. So I don't know. I don't know if any of us knows what's going to happen. We're in the, the midst of the biggest epic, <laughs> the story of stories. It is, as people are saying, of biblical proportions. Are we going to make it? Are we going to make this collective um, jump into hyperspace where there is the ascension of enough consciousness to raise the whole planet and be on a frequency that is that, that dissolves the negative energy? Or are we going to succumb? So I don't know, but for me, and nobody does at this point, as far as I know, but being in a positive state, as you were pointing out when we're in our niche, we were both pointing out when we're doing what we love, then we're raising our vibration and that is contagious. So being in that kind of state and, and looking at the fact that we can collectively, creatively elevate English. I got to let you go. So you better let people know your websites again and how they can connect with you and how they can support you. And thank you so much for being here and playing around with words with me again today. I think that I personally got to some new levels of understanding of my worldview and I feel quite a bit expanded after this verbal romp right here. So thank you. Thank you. It was just delightful to converse with you. You are such a light, bright spirit and so open to allow divine wisdom to pour through you and articulate so clearly. It was just amazingly delightful. And I thank you. So my main website is wordmagicglobal.com. As you mentioned at the beginning, I also help people write their 
their books, their blogs, their promotional material, their sound bites, elevator speeches. I have a background as an intuitive as well as an English language linguist. So I combine those skills to help you be you in words and be you to false. So you can reach me at my website, L-A-U-R-E-L-A-I-R-I-C-A dot com. I also have a Patreon site. It's patreon.com slash word magic global. I haven't been all that active on it, but I'm about to share quite a bit more. And so through your patronage, I will be able to publish more of my books. What is available right now is our two books. I have a few copies left of a book called Horsing Around, The Inside Word on Marriage and Horses. And you can go, that has a website. It's horsingaroundwithwords.com. Because there's only a few copies left, the price is, of course, higher. I also have copies of Word Magic Wordplay that puts a new spin on the world. And that has a comes with a CD of me reciting the anthology of verse that I have inside that little book and many other books ready to be born. And with a little bit of patronage, I will be able to put them out in the world. If you enjoy obscure and fascinating vocabulary, I will be happy to send you a copy of my book, Defining Moments, Words That Invoke the Whole World in a Few Syllables, if you know what I mean. And that, that is for a $15 donation. So thank you very much and love and blessings to everybody. And, and for the literary lotto, please just ask inwardly for an inspired new word and phrase and send it in with a dollar. I'll be collecting them. And with others, we'll make a determination for, say, for a two-month period about what rings our bells the most and we think will ring others. And we'll start doing things to market them. And you will be recognized for your genius. and, And we will find ways for all of these inspired words to go out into the world that we contribute to in addition to your own promotion of the beauty that came through you. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for being here once again. And thanks for this rousing conversation. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Well, everybody, it's just you and me now. Just you and me all the way here at the end of the episode. I miss Laurel already, though. She is a bright and bubbling fountain of (laughs) happiness and joy and her self-expression is always a real pleasure to listen to. It was excellent to have her recite multiple poems and I like how sometimes she just drops into it. It's pretty impressive to be able to remember lyrics and language in that level of complexity and memorize it. But amazingly, that was not a very uncommon thing in our ancient past. When you look at poets like Homer with insanely long works like the Iliad, guys would actually memorize that entire thing. And the oral tradition is pretty much lost on us in these days. And that must also indicate that we have misplaced our ability to remember things in large, complex webs, you know? So there's a lot of ways that we might be able to reclaim those powers and find them again. I've heard of a cool concept called the memory castle, which I haven't honestly put into practice much myself. But if we look back at the last episode where we talked to Shelley Care about a lot of things, but one of the, maybe it was in the plus extension, but one of the things that came up was the, the ha- sacred space or the happy place, as she calls it, which is a pretty common thing for occult training or consciousness training to make a sort of astral plane temple for yourself that is just your place that you build with your imagination. But the interesting thing is that you can return to it. And even if it was kind of complicated, whenever you think of that place again or try to go there again, whenever you're in a balanced brainwave state, a meditative posture, if you will, it'll all be there as you left it. And it could possibly be pretty complex imagery wise. So The memory castle concept, as I understand it, is that you create maybe like a memory representation of a place you know, maybe your home, or you can create an entirely new 
thing, a uh, new area, if you will, of house or a temple or whatever it might be. And you put the things that you want to remember in certain parts of this structure. And I think it might be easier if it was a place you're familiar with, like your house, you might put something that you need to remember or wanted to uh, be able to recall more easily on your kitchen table or something like that. I may be butchering it. I didn't even honestly expect to start talking about memory castle just now, but the real point I wanted to make was that it's impressive for poets to be able to recite huge amounts of lyrics, just like it is for professional lyricists to get on stage and sing with a band or whatever, but we all have that power. So just look at some of the best. If you want an indication of what your potential might be able to even surpass if you were to give it a shot. And I think a real key to being able to access our higher levels of language ability is to understand what actually gives us intelligence in the first place, where creative intelligence comes from. And I'm sure everyone's heard about every last thing in the universe that it's about balance. <laughs> Whatever you're talking about, it's about balance. But the word intelligence actually tells you what the balance is in the word. It's intellect plus the generative principle intelligence. It's not intellect. It's not generation. It's intelligence, intelligeneration. <laughs> I liked Laurel's word intelligental. That's pretty cool too. But what the compound word is telling us is that the left brain, which is the intellect and the right brain, which is the creative generative side of ourselves need to be in balance if we want to have intelligence. So creative intelligence, that's the key. I think part of that equation also is about balancing your input and output, because that's another metaphorically symbolic representation of left and right brain. See if you can get closer to creating as much as you consume in whatever way feels like your way to do that. I mean, don't make yourself crazy about it. Obviously, <laughs> it'd be pretty hard to equate in a mathematical sense that you're exactly creating the same amount of value or material as you're consuming. In fact, it's kind of impossible. But just value your creative pursuits and what does come out of those very high. And if you do value those things and rank them in your life experience as being some of the most important things that you could get up to doing, then I think you'll spend a lot of time doing it. And you probably will be, relatively speaking, more balanced with your consumption and creation. And it doesn't even matter what that creation is. It's just about exercising that part of yourself, whether it could just be like journaling, even it could be st simple stuff. It doesn't have to be for anyone else. But the great thing is once you become a more intelligent person or a more generative person, because most people have plenty of intellect, but are really lacking on the right brain side, then the stuff that you are doing is going to be naturally more valuable to others at all times. So I think uh, the green language thing is another concept that is related to this idea of balancing intellect and generative principle. Green language is something we specifically talked about the first time around with Laura Laurel, but it's an occult concept of, it's also sometimes called the language of the birds, language of the bards. But what it means is being able to see the deeper meanings in words that you're looking at. And we got into some examples of that in this episode, but it's all over the place. I, <laughs> I'll just pick a random word that's popping into my head. Energy. This is a really good one. You have in er G. Those are the syllables there. It sounds like you're saying inner G. And G could stand for a lot of things, but it could definitely stand for this generative principle I'm talking about. If you have energy, energy, it's kind of a it's all about making intuitive associations. You can even do it on a numerological level with what you would call green language. Just start thinking with both sides of your brain about words and see what pops in. I'd love to hear some people's examples of green language interpretations of various things that they have. You know, etymology is a good way to come to these two. Send them in, though. Leave a comment on this episode or put a email in my inbox. And also, don't forget, if you are starting to play around with language, that Laurel has that literary lotto thing that you can submit some upgrades to our everyday speech to her through and maybe get a little kickback for that. I know she needs a lot more participants and she wants to make a big thing of it. So as many of you guys that do go participate, that would be better. 
Another good green language example would be Solomon, like King Solomon, the guy who I guess had magical occult powers, according to the esoteric versions of Judaism and Christianity. His name actually represents this very concept I'm talking about of left and right brain balance because it's Saul, which is sun, and moon or mon, Solomon, <laughs> sun and moon. The Temple of Solomon is actually symbolic of our physical body. Rebuilding the temple, that whole like Masonic uh, occult concept that the Temple of Solomon needs to be rebuilt to somehow usher in the Christ consciousness era or whatever. You know, I don't put stock in any one religious interpretation of anything, but symbolically what that is actually referring to, if you ask me, is rebuilding our body because that's <laughs> what was supposed to be going on in the Temple of Solomon. It was supposed to be like a dwelling place for God. So your body, if you rebuild it into the best possible temple you can make it into, that's where you get the intelligence of the creative force of the entire universe coming and dwelling within you in higher and higher capacities. So that's a fun one, Solomon. And then another symbol of that is the seal of Solomon, which is the six-pointed triangle. It's two, not six-pointed triangle, six-pointed star. It's two triangles, an upward, upward facing triangle and a downward pointing triangle merged together in a balanced way. So that's the sun and moon right there, the two different directional triangles, male and female, left and right. So it's uh, <laughs> those are fun examples of green language. I think humanity is just now even barely, <laughs> at least in the, the mass consciousness, being able to reckon with these kind of concepts because language has been taken so literally before and not literarily enough <laughs> up to this point. So, uh, you know, another good thing about language for sharpening your language skills, I find that the more often I read, the better I am at writing and speaking. When I read well-written things, it seems to program my mind and my language capacity to be better, more efficient. So try that out if you think that you struggle with language. Try reading more. That seems like an obvious one to me, but maybe not so obvious to everybody else. And there's lots of good stuff to read out there. So don't give yourself the excuse that you just don't like to or there's nothing good to read. I mean, even reading fiction is going to have this effect, maybe even in a stronger way, potentially, because fiction is a more of a right brain immersive adventure, whereas just reading nonfiction, reading facts about stuff, unless you're getting some kind of narrative of historical events, doesn't do it in the same way. It's more abstract, more purely left brain. Doesn't mean you shouldn't read things that are strictly research based and non-fictional, but if, especially if you think reading's too boring for you, for whatever reason, find some good fiction and, and go for that. The great other thing about fiction, especially when it hasn't gone through the slaughterhouse of Hollywood refinement and it's in its pure state, like in a novel or comic books, great example, is that the imagination being the source of this uh, transmission that you're taking in, in the form of fiction, there's going to be very symbolic truths that come through the narrative that might likely have not even been implanted there on purpose by the author, but they're more like just reflections of the, the matrix, the universal author, if you will. But yeah, this was a great episode. I had a lot of fun with it. I guess I should tell you about the plus extension at this point. <laughs> kind of forgot that that was part of the outro. But if you guys are on the free show and only getting the first hour, remember you can support me and get twice as much Interverse by going to patreon.com forward slash Interverse. And of course, I have that linked in the show notes. I think it's super worth it, especially because you probably just got your government issued $1,200. Give me a cut of that. <laughs> $5 a month It's barely like you know, buying me a couple of coffees for the month or a really fancy coffee. Not that I need more coffee, but look at it like that. It's a pretty small price to pay considering how much effort goes into delivering this content to you on my end. It's great effort, it's, but it's also great. I'm grateful for the effort because like I was kind of talking about a few minutes ago, putting that time and effort into creating makes me, I think, feel at least more balanced on a regular basis. I don't feel like there's this big thing missing in my life that I did feel was missing before I was a self-labeled artist, when I realized that we're all artists in some way. And so I hope that you guys are doing that in your own way. 
please support the podcast if you have any ability to do so. If you like it at all, you're going to enjoy the plus extensions. I definitely want more people to hear them because they're always really, really good. I mean, how could they not be? We've already been going for an hour. We've warmed up. There's a lot of stuff on the table, a lot of dots to connect, and it always works out to be really awesome. So in this episode's plus extension with the wonderful Laurel Erica, we talked about the new religion of scientism and Rupert Sheldrake's, Sheldrake's book, The Science Delusion, healing the words of our worldview and the invasion of cloned personalities and opinions in our culture, a mystical way of etymologically defining the phrase conspiracy reacher, re- conspiracy researcher, mixing up. Reading's hard, guys. <laughs> That's why I want to do more of it. Uh, we talked about the way human nations have had a history of operating at a level of consciousness akin to ants which is pretty true. We talked about one of my favorite words, anatiodromia, which is the tendency of all things to inevitably become their opposite or to contain their opposite. Talked about becoming intelligental and reuniting our intellect with generosity and the generative principle and what it means that you are omnificent. That's a great word. You're omnificent. It means you have all creative power and potential in yourself, which I think is the best kind of omni to be. Laurel also gave us a reading of the lyrics from her musical collab with rapper Truth Seeker, a song called Speaking Beauty, which you can also probably go look up. And the meaning and mean, <laughs> the mean meaning of mean and determining significance and magnificent magnificence instead of definitions. That was a tongue twister. I did that to myself. But basically, the word mean and meaning itself, there's a lot of interesting homonym action going on with the word mean and meaning. And So we talked about determining significance and how humans have that power and what it means for us. (laughs) But I think uh, other than that, I'm ready to get out of here. Happy 420. I'm going to go celebrate by getting outside for a little while. Hope you guys are having a good April. Entire month of 420, as I said in the intro. And I'm going to play us out with Drum Spider, our old friend Drum Spider, and his remix of a song called Banner of Grief by a group called Boreal Hymn. So that's going to be linked in the show notes too. Hope you like it. And it's been a fun one. Thanks again to Laurel. Make sure you go support her in any way you can. At the very least, check out her Word Magic album on Spotify because that's easy to do for free. But she's looking for collaborators of all kinds. And I hope that some of you are inspired to make contact with her at the very least in some way to show your appreciation for her giving us her time today but even better yet if you got video editing skills or animation skills or audio producing skills or want to put music to her verse or want to create some kind of artwork that she can work with maybe you know what would be cool is if somebody made a painting or something and then passed it off to laurel to do a poetic accompaniment with the painting get creative (laughs) collab with her she's awesome And she needs more collaborators. So thanks for being here with us, everybody. Love you all very much. It's a blast to do these podcasts with you. Really excited about the shows that I've got coming up. And at the time that this comes out, either it's coming out really soon or might already be out. But I just did a show with a couple of guys called The Conspiracists. So look up The Conspiracists podcast. (laughs) Cron instead of con. So like chronic, it is 420 after all. Weed and conspiracies. And I went deep on some theoretical conspiracies that I find the dankest. It was really fun. So if you're subscribed to The Conspiracists on whatever you like to listen to podcasts on, you'll probably catch the new episode with me when it comes out. Uh, But if you forget about that, don't worry. I'll remind you in some way. I might even post it to this feed. So yeah, thanks for being here once again. Love you all once again. Got to always say that at least a couple times because it's so true. <laughs> Makes me feel really warm and fuzzy inside that even though I'm sitting here in my office by myself talking into a piece of electronic equipment, that on the other end of that, somewhere in the time stream, you're hearing it and hopefully cracking a smile like I am because it's awesome that we can be together like this. All right. Enjoy the drum spider and I'll talk to you guys soon.